All right, we are going to get started. Thanks again for joining us. I'm Katrina McAfee. I am the marketing manager here at A2. Um, you are here for Analytics in Action, our 2023 how-to webinar series. This is the first of the year, so we're super excited to have you with us. I'm going to introduce our host today, if you have never joined us. We have Bill Comforti, our SVP of Strategy and Solutions here at A2, and Greg Pollock, our VP of Sales. And both of them have tons of years of combined experience in the association space um, and in the software um, industry. Uh, so you're in good hands. I am going to now pass it over to Greg to get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm super excited. I was talking with Katrina and Bill earlier. This is year three of Analytics in Action, and I want to thank everybody for joining us for um, first session of the year, right? Getting everything back in That's action fun. this year, talking about decision making and data, and boy, are we excited to do that. We love to start with it just for fun, so I know there's a bunch of you on the chat. Make sure you change it to so it says for everyone, not just hosts and panelists, so we can all see you. Um, and welcome, Benjamin, from Chicago. What is your uh, welcome, Niru, from London? What's your best memory from 2022? Drop it in the chat. Let us know as we get started. What are we talking about today? So we're talking about how smart associations are maintaining relevance and revenue. And to get ready for this, boy, we talked with lots of smart associations and we asked them lots of questions. And Bill and I sat here in our office for a couple hours and we said, smart associations, fill in the blank. Um, and we talked about what smart associations are doing. And hopefully we can talk to you about what smart associations are doing. Um, there's a loaded phrase in here though, and we're gonna tackle that today is in today's economy. So. We'll cover that out a few times today. Cool. So, um, yeah, so this is kind of like a, an aggregate of a bunch of the diff uh, different topics that we've been covering lately. We covered how to develop and refine your value proposition. We covered how to uh, how to make a business case for analytics or, or really for any program that you uh, that you want to push forward in your association. We talked about uh, calculating ROI. Um, so. You know, all this stuff is important all the time, but it's really critical leading up to and through uh, uh, times of, of economic uncertainty. So uh, with uh, with that in mind, I want to just quickly uh, pitch our uh, next how-to webinar, which is uh, how to build a, a data strategy, all right? So this is this underlies most of what we're gonna talk about today. And I think the emphasis for this one is gonna be that this is not as hard as you think. Um, so we had our uh, user conference uh, recently, and you know, big room. We polled over 200 people, 200 association professionals, and uh, Reggie Henry was in front of the room. And he says, and he's asked everybody, you know, how many of you have a data strategy? And literally, like one or two hands went up uh, in the in the entire room. And so, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that, but I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, it's it's too difficult, or it's something that we'll do uh, later. We'll get around to it, that sort of thing. Uh, so we're going to fix all that, right? Um, you're going to uh, leave that one ready to convene a group of stakeholders and to get a basic strategy uh, down on paper. So I'm um, looking forward to uh, to seeing you all in a couple of weeks for that. Okay, um, so great. What's uh, on the agenda for today? Awesome. Well, our agenda today is going to start with you all. We're going to ask you some questions and get your feedback in the chat, but also in some polls. Um, we're going to talk about how to focus this year on the, the things that really matter and how to really focus on delivering value to your members and we're gonna talk about delivering timely value to your members because we think right now there are specific needs that your members have. Um, we're gonna to react to what we hear from when we have conversations with you all, which is, you know, we're trying to do more with less. And we're gonna talk about some strategies on doing more with less. We'll wrap it up with some pro tips, some Q&A, and we'll have a great webinar along the way. So who are we? Um, I always like to cover this because we always see fresh spaces on the webinars. If this is your first time joining us, Welcome and thanks a lot for joining us. So we are Association Analytics. We are a software company exclusively focused on helping associations love their data. And that is a whole bunch of stuff from data visualizations to integrations to data governance and data cleanup and best practices. Um, all of that helping you love your data, helping you make better data informed decisions. That's who we are as a company. All right. Um, so let's jump into uh, our poll. I think there's only one official poll uh, today, but there's a lot of times when I'm going to ask you to participate, jump in the chat and, uh, uh, and answer some stuff for us. So uh, poll question. Uh, we're expecting our 2023 financial performance to show blank. 
major growth, minor growth, about the same, minor decline, hopefully not too many major declines, and maybe a few of us don't really know. All right. Looks like most of the people have uh, have answered. So for uh, to, so for the benefit of those that are on the uh, uh, on the recording, so we have uh, twelve percent said major growth, another nine said minor growth. Uh, most of us, uh, about half, you know, said that we're expecting about the same as twenty twenty two. So for those of you that said that, um, how do we feel about that? Right? Do we uh, we consider that a win? Is that uh, is that uh, good news coming uh, you know out of the pandemic, um, or you know had you been experiencing major growth uh, prior to that, right? So uh, give us some context on that uh, about the same. Um, a few of us are twenty, uh, a little over twenty percent are expecting a minor decline, right? Um, understandable, right? Uh, considering uh, some of the conditions that are uh, you know that we're all faced with, and then uh, twelve percent not sure. So a handful of us are are not sure. Um, any uh, any big surprises there, Greg? No big surprises from my part. Um, I'm excited that people are expecting major growth. I think that's really exciting. I do think um, Megan here in the chat is sort of foreshadowing what we're going to talk about a little bit down the road here, which is, you know, if we're not increasing revenue, can we decrease expenses? Can we cut some of those programs that aren't generating revenue and ultimately make a profit? And that's one of the secret hidden things we're going to be talking about today. So I'm excited. Um, smart associations are already chatting with us about the strategies. Yeah, great. Okay, cool. So, uh, so we're looking for some good, uh, you know, just sort of, you know, sort of some context, right? And and so what's really happening around? And uh, uh, so I found this interesting article in uh, in Forbes, right? So there's a lot being written about, you know, how the the economy is affecting our business and our personal finances. Um, and so here's what Forbes says: are the biggest challenges uh, facing uh, businesses? And you know, and and some of you are probably thinking, hey, this doesn't apply to us. You know, we're associations and you know, um, to that, I would say, number one, associations are businesses, of course. And second, um, Greg will talk a little bit more about this is like your customers are businesses, right? And uh, even if they're not, they're individuals that work for businesses. So all of these factors, all of these things are really affecting all of us uh, at some level. So uh, first and foremost, right, uh, inflation and economic downturn, right? So we have high inflation, we have low growth. That means a lot of us are going to be reducing spending. And so a lot of what we'll talk about today is how you can be um, deliberate about uh, about spending, being more targeted about how you spend, and also keep in mind that your members are doing the same thing, right? So we have to make sure that we make the cut, right? They're uh, they're being more uh, more deliberate about how they're spending their money as well. Um, so supply chain. So, to Greg, I think a lot of associations play a, a key part in the supply chain. No. Yeah, I mean, if if your members are the buyers and your industry partners are the suppliers and they get together every year at your annual trade show, what a great place to talk about supply chain um, management and how we're gonna be able to overcome these challenges. And what a great way for you as an organization to make revenue by connecting the two dots there. I literally think each one of these points appears as a challenge on the Forbes list for businesses is an opportunity for us as associations to solve that challenge. And supply chain is a great one you know, where do the suppliers and buyers connect at the trade show? Let's get them all there and let's talk about the important issues we have. Maybe it's not in a physical booth setting. Maybe it's more in uh, hosted buyer sessions or one-on-ones or smaller yeah. groups. Um, I think that could be a really big opportunity for us. Yeah. So uh, increasing customer expectations, right? So this is, you know, we've been, we've been talking about this for a couple of years now, right? Maybe longer. Um, but uh the tighter the spending gets, the greater the value the members are going to need in order to to justify that that expense. So um, I think we all sort of know that this is the case, right? Uh, anecdotally, at least. But uh, uh, if you really dive into the data, you can uh, see some uh, you can see some clues that that's really that really is the case, and also how well your association is doing in response to that. Uh, so accelerated uh, uh, digital transformation. This one for me is really about member experience, right? Do you have the right tools and technologies to support those? Uh, increasing uh, member expectations. And so on one hand, you know, we talked about how you want to be deliberate about spending your money. So you might be inclined to just, you know, sort of tighten the purse strings when it comes to this sort of thing. Probably not the best idea, right? So that's not what the smart associations are doing. That's what the uh, risk averse and maybe some of the uh, the, the scared associations uh, are, uh, are doing. Uh, this one's really interesting. The war for talent 
uh, will intensify. I'm interested to uh, to hear if that's one that really lands for for people on the on the call today. I mean, we hear it a lot, um, in particular with talent that knows about analytics. Um, you know, our managed service business is is doing well primarily because of the war for talent uh, for people that uh, that know a lot about data, and uh, so. It, it's it's not just customers that have increased expectations, it's employees as well, right? So you have to ask, right, are you doing the things that you need to do to keep those top employees, right? Training, professional development, uh, not to mention, you know, things like flexibility and diversity, uh, leadership and, and all of that. So uh, nothing you didn't already know, but it's a good to keep that top of mind. I want to uh, say that's another, that's another opportunity though. When I worked for an association, part of our job was to stimulate the pipeline of employees from K through 12, high school, all the way through university to get more people in engineering. And they created programs and services that big companies sponsored and they delivered those to high schools and grade schools to get kids excited about engineering. If the war for talent is intensifying, what is our role as an association in stimulating that pipeline of future, uh, future workers? And how can we leverage our existing partners and sponsors who wanna hire those workers how can we leverage them as partners to help pay for those programs to get their next new worker um, trained up and ready and excited to be in the profession? I think our job as associations is to to play a, a part in that puzzle. Yeah, I agree. And uh, uh, this is a, a topic for another day, but just I, th I think it's relevant to this is um, a lot of a, a lot of uh, associations and a lot of uh, professionals on the call. You have a um, a career hub, right? A, a, a job, um, job board, something like that. And uh, don't talk about it a lot, right? I mean, I, I rare, almost never hear about that as a member benefit that, uh, you know, that um, associations are, are really pushing. And I think that's something that you can, uh, that's, you know, real value, unique value that you can bring to your members in a, in a time like this. So it's uh, helpful. Uh, so data and device security is maybe not as big for, for associations in other industries, but still data security and data privacy um, are uh, are really important, right? It's kind of like table stakes. You have to uh, have to look after that. And last one is sustainability. So this one is interesting, right? Because I think For Forbes is really talking about like sustainability in the environmental sense. Like, you know, do you publicize your, your practices uh, that are you know good for the planet and so forth? Um, which uh, so that's a question, actually. Let's. Uh, I'm, I'm curious how many are doing that, right? Do you, do you put um, statements about your sustainability practices on your website? Do your members care about that sort of thing? Is it uh, is that a way to uh, to connect with them? Is that part of your mission? Um, so if anyone has uh, has any insight on that, I'm I'm curious, and I think others would be as well. And and the other thing I would say is uh, sustainability of your business as well, right? I mean that's a uh, uh, that's something that obviously that is, uh, is top of mind in, uh, in, in an uncertain economy. So, okay, so great. Um, as you said, right, all of these things are, are not just uh, challenges, right? They're, they're also, there's also opportunities, right? Yeah, certainly. I think every one of these challenges is an opportunity for us in the association market to create products and services that help solve these challenges, to use them to sharpen our member benefits. And, and to Bill's point, we're businesses as well, right? If, the customer expectations are increasing. Are we providing uh, increased member value? If the you know the war for that last dollar, that next dollar is important, are we sharpening our pencil with member value? I was on the call with a, a membership professional, and she was sort of complaining about how like the discount for insurance is a member benefit. She's like, that's not a member benefit we should offer. We should be offering our members real benefits they can't get elsewhere. If you want to discount on your insurance or at the hotel, you know, become a AAA member. That's not what we're about. We don't need to be spending time and effort creating these member benefits that aren't our member benefits. And I think that's a really big um, thing I've seen associations is really focus and sharpen the pencil and figure out what is our unique value proposition and how can we quickly articulate that to our prospects and provide an ROI for our prospects. Just like if you're going to you know, buy a product or a software, you're going to scrutinize what's the ROI on this. Your members are scrutinizing what's the ROI on joining this association and, and they're thinking the same thing you are. I want to ask your help in the chat, and I need everybody to chat with me here. Um, we use the phrase in today's economy, and I felt like that had a lot of baggage that it came with, right? And I found this great picture of this boat out there. It may be raining, but there may be some sun out there. The water is choppy, but it looks kind of calm. Like, what does today's economy mean to you? So one or two words, maybe a phrase or so, is today's economy about 
a potential inflation? Is it about a potential economic downturn? Maybe today's economy is less attendees at our trade show, or maybe today's economy is booming. I've talked with lots of associations who told me that right now the economy is helping their association, right? I know realtor associations were having a tremendous boom. Um, hospitality associations are, are feeling a tremendous boom right now with all these people traveling again. But I've also heard this uncertainty, right? Attendees are registering later and later and later for our events. So how are we supposed to plan an event if our registrations are behind where they used to be? So love to hear, I hear a lot of these uncertain, right, volatile. And part of what we wanna do today is we wanna provide a tool set and a language to sort of cut through some of that uncertainty where it's no longer our opinions and our feelings are driving our decisions. We're allowing data to drive the decisions and the data is gonna help us really figure out what we need to focus on and how we need to uh, sharpen that pencil. So thanks everybody for chatting about your um, today's economy thoughts. Cool, uh, quick question. Um, lots of uh, lots of chat uh, fodder here, but um, I think we asked this question you know, back in the the early uh, early days of COVID, like whether um, whether any associations were making sort of uh, concessions or like uh, making accommodations for members that were um, you know facing some kind of hardship, uh, you know, whether with their job or otherwise as a result of COVID. So uh, same question now, right? You know, people, for all the reasons you mentioned, right? High personal expenses, you know, rocky outlook for the economy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, some people are are your you know. Uh, Employment numbers are not as as good as they once were. So all those things in mind, um, is any are any associations sort of making concessions or changes uh, to their dues or or member structures or anything like that? That'd be um, interesting to know. Okay. So um, along the lines of what Greg was talking about, um, I thought of the hedgehog concept. I know this is uh, familiar to um, to a lot of you. It's part of you know one of my favorite uh, business books, uh, Good to Great by uh, Jim Collins. And hedgehog concept is is really a way that um, I mean it's it's the, the way Collins talks about it. It's like you know separating companies that succeed from those who don't, right? And there's this old fable about the fox that does many things and the hedgehog that really does one thing. And how do you, as a business and as an association, find the primary thing that your association does better than anyone else, right? Find that unique value, and you do that by asking a couple of questions, and those are. What are you deeply passionate about? And so he's writing this from the perspective of like an entrepreneur, really. But as a bit, as an association, this is about your mission, right? What is it that your organization and your members are passionate about? Um, what can you be uh, the best in the world at, all right? Or what can you be really good at, uniquely good at? Um, and then the last one is what drives your economic engine, right? So it has to be something that aligns with the mission. It has to be something that... Um, that you're uniquely positioned to be good at, like a right. It's it's not the discount on the insurance. It's the um, uh, it's the learning, right? Or it's the networking, or it's those practice resources, right? This thought leadership um, that you can provide, right? And what drives the economic engine? Um, you know, most of the time these are going to be uh, things that generate a lot of revenue, but not necessarily, right? It might be something that leads to. Uh, that leads to revenue down the road. So kind of like the intersection of all of those things are what's known as your hedgehog. And, um, you know, when it's always good to focus on those things, you know, for, to be long-term successful, but even more so when uh, when times are, are tougher. So how can we start moving the needle? And, and we've talked about this so far is really sharpening the pencil, focusing on what moves the needle for you. And a part of that focus is gonna be stopping to do things, right? Cutting some of the excess, cutting some of the waste that isn't mission critical. It's not what you're passionate about and it doesn't drive revenue, but it's things we do, it's capacity we spend to not get a big enough return, right? So how can we focus on what moves the needle? And we all like to use this word successful, right? It's a successful event. These are successful courses. That document we produced was successful. The the industry study we did was successful. So I wanna start asking that question, what is successful? What is most valuable? How do you measure and quantify most valuable? And here I've got two different products my association offers. What's most valuable, right? And this is sort of a catch 22, cause on the left we have product A and I only sold one of them last year, but I sold it for a hundred thousand dollars. That was pretty, pretty good, right? And I've got product B but I sold a thousand of those last year. The price point was way less, only a hundred dollars a pop. 
but I made the same amount of revenue, right? So here we have to ask ourselves, which one's most valuable for our organization? Which one should we cut? And which one should we continue to do? Now, I haven't given you enough information to answer this question. I've sort of given you the, the, the information that doesn't help. But then you're starting to ask yourself, well, what if this one person doesn't buy it next year, right? Can we, can we sustain that product if the one customer doesn't buy it? Or what if three people buy it next year? That would be tremendously good, right? And then with product B, is there some sort of capacity issue? Do I have to do something every time I sell this? Is there something I have to do to produce this? Um, so Megan got it right. It really depends on your org and it depends on the products you're selling and offering. But start to look at your product mix and the things you offer and look beyond these numbers that don't answer the question. It's not how much revenue did each of these products make. It's all the details behind the scenes because what we're going to start to learn is when we analyze our products and services, they don't really look like an Excel spreadsheet. They kind of look like this. And this is a, a way to represent all of the online courses that my association offers. Each one of these um, little circles with the letters in it, these are the courses I offer. And they're my, my internal codes I've made up, right? The colors are the type of course, what track it might be a part of. And then those blue concentric circles are the pathway members follow as they take and buy these courses. And looking at it here, I can immediately figure out where value lives, right? These courses right in the middle are my hot sellers. This is where people start the journey. And these other courses are, are, you know, the next step for them. This is deeper engaging them. But I can see not all of these courses are equally valuable out there on the outside, right? Some of these courses in that last circle, nobody's taken that course. That's not a member benefit anymore. That's something we started to produce five years ago because somebody was passionate about it. And we've just kept it on our virtual shelf collecting dust, right? Now, you say there's nothing wrong with that, Greg. It's on the shelf. It's fine. If somebody wants to buy it, they can go ahead and buy it. But then what happens? to that member experience when they engage in that course on the outside, right? So we've got two different examples here. Example one is Greg goes to the ASE website and he starts to learn about what ASE does. And he, he comes across this great um, document called Foresight Works. If you've never uh, read this, I encourage you to read it. They talk about looking around the corner into the future. And I said, that's really great. These people at ASE are smart. I should do more with them. So then I, I apply for the CAE and I start taking credits and I start registering for events. I start going to partner events like this. And overall, I've spent tons of money with the organization because my entry point, the gateway into the organization was successful. And I found a pathway to the next thing and the next thing versus um, I, I, I hate to bash this event, but I went to the Future Leaders Conference and boy, it was not what I thought it was going to be, right? It was not the right audience for me to talk to. It was kind of over my head. I wasn't really ready. I didn't have the best time. And I didn't go apply for the CAE and I didn't go get all those extra courses. So while in an Excel spreadsheet, all of these products might look valuable to you as an organization, when we really get into that member experience, we start to realize that there's two vastly different experiences this delivers to the member. And as we're sharpening our pencil and figuring out what value is for us, we need to start cutting some of these things that don't fit in with our messaging. They don't fit in with what we're trying to accomplish. All right, thanks, Greg. That's uh, that's really interesting. So I wanna just make a quick comment on that. It doesn't necessarily have to be an either or, right? It doesn't have to be A or B. Um, so you might have separate product lines that have their own unique value, right? Um, there might be separate customer segments that you pursue, like maybe uh, this one, you know, future leaders is really just for the executives and uh, the other track is for another segment, right? And so uh, when it comes to that that hedgehog uh, concept, it's it's not necessarily like one particular product or one very specific thing. It's more like an overarching um, uh, approach, right? And things that, that fit under that versus um, things that don't. And so um, the point is, right, we're, we're, we're taking that deliberate approach and we have to evaluate um, the impact, but we have to evaluate that in uh, in the context of the cost and complexity, right? So it may be that, you know, for example, that, uh, that one big $100,000 product, uh, you know, we only had to sell one of those, right? So maybe like the, the cost of selling it was, was quite small, right? Maybe, uh, maybe there was very little effort there um, at all, but it's, it was very expensive to put it together, right? I and mean, that's, it's a big, um, it's a big, uh, um, you know, complex, you know, product, right? Whereas the the other one is quite different. Maybe it's something that's that's done online, and there's you know almost no cost to to produce as many of them as you need. But 
um, or to uh, uh, to run that as many times you need, but uh, there's some expense to put it together and then to sell it, right? All those, uh, you know, 10,000 times or however many times we did. Anyway, uh, so we look at the business impact, we look at the return, we look at the reach, right? Uh, how big of a swath of our customers and members does it, uh, um, does it apply to? And how does it align with our strategy, right? Our mission, right? The thing that we're passionate about, right? Uh, and then balance that with complexity and cost. There are lots of different ways to do it. A simple matrix like this is a good is a good way to do that. Okay, um, and it's not just the returns and uh, you know the financial returns of the specific product and how much it costs to execute it. Like right here in the moment, we're also concerned with the member experience, right? How does that build? I mean, because ultimately we have to be building our association uh, towards like highly connected loyal members, right? So those members that um, that pay dues and that never do anything else with the association are, you know, they're fine. I mean, they're paying today's bills, right? Um, and so uh, we need some like that, but they're not the ones that are the future of the association, right? The ones that um, that are the future are, you know, are the ones that are that are loyal, that are highly engaged, they're connected, they're volunteering, they're contributing content, and maybe they're making donations. And they don't just start doing that from day one, right? So you have to bring them along, um, you know, get them to join as a member. You have to show them value. Usually that comes through something like education or um, some of those um, kind of inexpensive or maybe me member benefit type products. And ultimately um, you get them to that, uh, uh, to that connected stage. Okay. Um, so now we're going to talk about uh, delivering unique value and, and, and timely, right? And so this is that, uh, like, what can you be the best at, right? So you're in a uh, unique position um, as an association, right? You have to, so you have to focus on, on that uniqueness and you, and you have some advantages um, that, that no one else has, right? So, so Greg, what are, uh, what are some of the advantages that we have? Let me take that from the counterpoint. So I'm just a for-profit company. And I want to go out there and start a company that competes with your association. I got a huge uphill battle to fight because you have all these built-in advantages that I don't have and I'm fighting uphill and it's probably a losing battle for me, right? Why is it so hard to compete with an association? Because they have all these built-in benefits, right? They're a mission-driven organization, which is a tax status, which means their business isn't paying taxes on that where my for-profit company is, but it's more than that, right? It's more than just the mission-driven part. It's the like, you guys are domain knowledge experts. You've been doing this for 50, 60, 100 years, and you have all the industry experts there at your fingertips, and you've got this vast library of knowledge at your fingertips, right? You can crowdsource things. If we don't have the domain knowledge in-house, we can find the expert who can do that and can deliver that value to everybody else. And we do that through networking because we have all the context. We know all the movers and shakers, right? They come to our events. They network with us. We've been tracking them and scoring their engagement for years. We have all these tools at our fingertips that are unique to us as an association where we don't have to go build that or buy that or hire that person or find that person and, and convince them to work for us. We can ask that person to volunteer for us. We can rely on the vast amounts of knowledge we've already accrued as an association. And these competitive advantages right now are part of our, our porcupine, right? This is what we're gonna focus on to be able to be successful is what are these things that we can do out there that have a really high barrier to entry that are unique to us and we can start leveraging ourselves. And we wanna give you a couple examples of this here, but what are some of the unique values that we can we can leverage, Bill? All right, so it's a, it's kind of like, how do you uh, how do you find those things is uh, as you start to, to ask questions, right? So, uh, the first one, uh, most basically, is you know what can you offer that really can't be found anywhere else. And when we have our uh, engagement workshops, and when we start to talk about uh, strategic plans, and certainly anytime we talk about value proposition, this is kind of like the uh, the central question. And you know, usually, again, it's it's something like uh, I think learning is um, is a big one, right? And 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 we've done uh, webinars on on this before. Which is, you know, there there are a lot of companies that are prop, uh, popping up and competing with associations in the professional development space, right? And uh, uh, and, and sometimes they're even for free, right? So so we're kind of like competing with 
how do you compete with free, right? You know, there's a lot of uh, articles, uh, you know, out there about that, you know, but, but the way you do that is you focus on, on the unique value, right? So, so you have, uh, you, you have this group of kind of, uh, you know, uh, this somewhat homogenous group, right? Or, or with unique uh, shared interest um, and, uh, you know, working in the, in the same industry for the most part um, that are networking together, that are attending events together, doing all those things. And so I think that's really, uh, that's really where the unique value uh, lies. Um, so in the, no matter how unique and how valuable those products and services and all those things you're doing are, if you're not communicating that clearly to members, they don't know about it. And so the, the, the experience, uh, suffers from that. So, um, you want to make sure that you are, uh, communicating, um, all those things clearly. And then, um, uh, this is, uh, this, this is, a like, why do members join and why do members stay? Um, this is something that a lot of our, uh, a lot of our clients have started to do in, in surveys, like micro surveys. They just just ask, right? That's one of the best ways uh, to to collect uh, uh, to, to collect this type of data is to is to just ask them, right? Why did you join and why are you staying? Having the answers to that is um, uh, is really uh, invaluable, right? I mean, you, you you can't really put a price on that. So, uh, what I want to ask uh, uh, what I want to ask our our group now is. How do we know, right? We we think that we have unique value, right? We think that we're delivering uh, value and things that people can't get anywhere else. How do we know? What do we consult, right? How do we know why members join, right? How do we know why can they just, stay? Can I just ask around the office? Certainly somebody here knows, right? I go to my website and see what we say? Yeah, all right. We ask them, right? There we go. Ask them directly. Okay. Just ask them. All yeah. right. That's a good idea. Yeah. So, however you get it, right? Uh, member value survey. Yeah, that's uh, that's a good one. Um, the data is uh, is the key, right? So we're going to cover some of the ways that you do this. Um, ask and observe, right? So you can just ask directly. Um, there are lots of different ways that you can observe it, uh, but those are things like, uh, you know, is our value proposition strong? Um, is our engagement trending in the right direction? Uh, once we know the uh, you know once we know the value right once we kind of have our our hedgehog right to uh, uh, narrow down we have these products and services that we want to deliver we have to to op optimize how we do it right and we know a lot about our members that allows us to do that um, we have to segment right we have to address the right audience um, we have to use the right mode right because we have some that like in person uh, we have some that like online right some like a combination um, so we need to know that uh, and then of course timing so that's one of the things that um, is really hard for because of all the touch points that we have, right? We have that online community. Um, we have those surveys, right? We're in touch with the members all the time. So we have a sense for timing, like when's the right time to deliver that service? Whereas any sort of external entity is mostly relying on the members to reach out. So it's kind of like um, you can push the right services and products at the right time where others are not really going to be able to do that. Um, and then measure and refine, right? So we deliver those services, we deliver those products, and then we look at trending, right? Uh, is this is enrollment trending in the right direction, right? Is revenue trending in the right direction? Uh, what are our most popular? Uh, what are our most popular products, right? Uh, which ones lead to other things, right? So that's our overlap. If if I can get people, you know, to take this course, do they naturally tend to attend the annual conference, right? Or do they tend to get certified or do other things that we want them to do? Um, all of these overlaps and all of these correlations are how we go from that first bar on the engagement journey to the top bar, which is uh, our um, our highly connected uh, members. So, okay, so we're going to jump into these uh, a little bit now. So, um, so Greg, how do we find out? I think asking is a great way to learn, right? And directly asking them in the member survey we do once a year. Directly asking them by you know when they log in and update their profile or when they join and, and express their intent. Um, if you're a member of ASCE like I am, you get your prop fuel from Amy here on a regular basis. She's asking you directly, what do you want, right? But I would be cautious by solely relying on ask. How many of us have surveyed our members and all the members say, we really want this member benefit and we go out of our way to build it and two members buy that member benefit from us. It's like, did our members really need that or did they think they need that, right? So it's not just the asking part, it's also the observing part. And we want to observe in a number of ways. I want to observe what products they purchase. I want to observe what events they attend. I want to observe how that changes over time, right? 
And I want to start blending that together with my demographics so I can start analyzing that because it's not just observing a snapshot in time. This is what's happening. It's about observing how that changes over time. If this product was really, if this product was really popular five years ago, is it still really popular, right? If this product is popular with one demographic, is it really popular with everybody? And I think we go back to our competitive advantages slide, right? And we think about, well, associations have this huge competitive advantage. They can easily ask all their members and they're probably gonna get a pretty good response rate on that, right? They can ask their data and they can analyze it and they can get some really good historical trends. And my startup company can't do those things. I can't go survey the marketplace and ask them what products they want. And you also have a really big advantage with your online community. And are we gonna tell the story about that in a second here, Phil? Um, yeah, but I mean, uh, there's no slide for it, but yeah, we could definitely tell that okay. story. I'll tell that story now. So one of our um, analysts was working with a customer and they were looking at their community data and they were looking specifically at negative sentiment, right? And normally when you think about negative sentiment, you're like, oh, we've got we've to squash those conversations or moderate those. We got to do something about that. And she went back to them and she said, you know what this is? This is an opportunity to solve their challenges. And it was a, a marketing design association and their members were complaining in the community about, oh, it's so hard to figure out margins on this website with this tool. And, it, you know, this is a really big challenge we're all running into. And she said, this challenge is an opportunity for you to go solve that and create a net new member benefit that's right for them. I think about listening to our members. Um, ASAE did that. When the pandemic started, people were talking about force majeure. Right, so they saw that conversation in the community, they listened and they responded in real time. The ability to be nimble and really create not just, right, we talked about the unique thing, but the timely unique thing. We have literally our ear to the ground and our finger on the pulse of what these members want and what they care about and using something creative like negative sentiment to build net new products that respond to challenges our members have is a perfect use case for this, right? How are we relevant in today's um, challenges? You all articulated this challenge. Here's a resource on how to solve that challenge. And I think that's a great way that smart associations are leveraging their data um, to really create the products their members need without having to ask. Awesome. Thanks, Greg. Uh, great story. So um, one other quick one, right? Because I thought of this when we, we went to ask and observe. And here's a good example, just heard this story recently about why you should ask, but you should also observe, right? You should validate what you learned through asking. And so uh, one, one of our customers is, is uh, really good with uh, staying in touch with members through their communications and through their, uh, through their marketing surveys, um, email marketing, all of that. And um, so they ask regularly what their members want and very consistently when it comes to their events, members report that they want the uh, CE credits, right? They come to the meeting because they want to go to sessions and they want to get credits uh, toward their certification. And so they had they had been taking this as um, as fact, you know, for years. And once they started to to actually look at the data, they they basically it was quite clear that year after year, uh, less than half of the available CE credits were actually claimed. Right. So people still came to the event, but they never they never followed up. They never claimed the, the CE credits that they were entitled to. And so, you know, there, there may be some other factors involved that maybe it was too difficult or something, you know, but the point is, is that what people say they'll do and what they actually do are not always the same. So we want to uh, try to use both of those as, as data points and it's, it's data informed decision, right? It's, it's not data driven. That's, that's another webinar topic. So, okay. Right. So we've, uh, uh, we've collected and observed, uh, we've analyzed, right? So we've uh, started to uh, to segment and that sort of thing. And that's what allows us to to optimize, right? So we have this sort of homogenous uh, you know, group of, of, of customers and, and members and then all these products and services and, and content, you know, but really it's it's more like this. It's like, you know, we have our our reds and our and our blues. Um, and uh, and they actually, um, you know, want different content as well, right? So some of these are executives, right? So they want that big, expensive, you know, that leadership conference or whatever. Others are staff, and so they're looking for, uh, they're looking for uh, the uh, foresight works, right? So we have different segments. We absolutely can have parallel, um, you know, parallel tracks, and we can optimize the content and the um, and and the timing of that. And not only that, but the actual delivery, right? So we want to be sort of lining up our segments accordingly. So we're delivering 
in a in a very uh, efficient way the products and services that each segment of our membership or of our customer base uh, want to uh, want to buy and how they want to uh, to interact. Uh, and then we have to uh, uh, to measure and refine and improve. Wouldn't it be nice if we could ask and we could observe and we could optimize and we could just move on with our life, right? <laughs> but that's not how this works. Once we've got it set up, we've got to fine tune it because things change over time. Our, our instrument gets out of tune. The, the melody we're playing changes and we have to adapt with it. Um, so not only do we have to do all those things, but once we're set up, we then have to continually do those things and tweak and change. And I was talking with an organization earlier and they said they do A-B testing with their emails. They said they test price points out for their events where they'll email different populations of their membership, different price points for the event, and they'll see which one works the best. And then they'll say, okay, we know people are willing to pay more to come to this event, or we know people aren't willing to pay at all to come to this event. We just need to give it away for free, or we need to stop doing it. So it's all about measuring, testing, A-B measuring, testing your messages, changing up your subject lines. Um, I think we do this with our renewal campaigns, right? If we just run the same renewal campaign all year long, and expect our retention rate to magically get better, we're not doing our job, right? We got to change the subject line. We've got to change the messaging, the value proposition. We've got to change how we renew people throughout the year. Um, I was talking with a really smart membership professional and she said, we know that some people join to go to the annual conference and we know that they renew right before the conference. So when we send out those renewals, we don't say, look at all these member benefits. We say, hey, renew to go to the conference because that's why you joined in the first place. So it's all about refining your message and tuning and tweaking it. So you're really using the data to its fullest. It's not just a one and done, set it up and move on. All right. Every association I talk to says capacity is an issue. We don't have the staff. We have, we're doing more jobs than we've ever done before. Uh, ASCE had a survey of their members at annual two years ago. And the number one issue was capacity. We just don't have enough people. We can't hire them. We can't retain them. Um, that person who had all the industry knowledge just retired and walked out the door and we have to find three people to do that job. So how do we end up doing more with less, right? Because no one's raising their hand saying, I've got extra capacity, find some projects for me, right? So what we have to be able to do is we have to really figure out how we're going to do more with less. So how are we going to possibly do more with less, Bill? Okay, well, um, the first thing we have to do is, is we got to reduce the noise, right? So that's, uh, again, getting back to our hedgehog concept. There's lots of stuff that we just really shouldn't be doing anymore. If we can figure out a way to focus on the things that really move the needle, right? And that really uh, connect with our mission, that drive revenue, and that are unique values to our association, then we can do potentially less work and uh, we can achieve a lot, uh, a lot bigger impact from that. So um, you know, that's, that's one of the, um, that's one of the benefits, you know, that our customers have from, from using our software is when you look at all your products and services and the performance, you know, financial and registrations and otherwise, um, uh, and you look at the overlap, like what leads to additional, uh, additional activities and what doesn't, it can oftentimes be pretty clear which ones are the dead ends. And although that decision is difficult, uh, you can absolutely sunset some products, right? You can, uh, basically, uh, Simplify your life, right? Do uh, do fewer things, but do them better and more effectively. Um, so that's reducing noise, right? We're going to reduce the uh, the manual work, right? And the way you're going to do that is, you know, in, in the data sense, through integration, um, through um, if you have a tool, right? It's going to it's going to do integration. It's going to do compilation. It's going to do validation. It's going to do report creation, right? But any tool that you have, whether it's an analytical tool or something else, you can reduce that manual work, even if it requires an investment of time to set that up. Now's the time to really uh, to really focus on doing that. Um, if you can um, find a way to collaborate easier, right? Um, in the case of, of analytics, right? That single central source of truth means everyone has access to the same data. So it's fewer iterations to get to the right data to the right person, right? Um, not to mention, if you wanna share that data with other people, the frustration of, you know, uh, attaching a file and emailing it and then it changes and all that stuff. You wanna um, you know, make, that, make that easier. Uh, if you're successful, it leads to faster action, right? So we wanna be using the best tools we can that are gonna allow us um, not just to you know, create reports or to do a certain task, but we wanna be concerned with the downstream effects as well. So in the case of analytics, it's the consumption and the interpretation, right? So yeah, you don't have to deal with the Excel sheet, right? So it's easier for you, but neither do I, right? When you send it to me, 
it's clear what I should do with it, and there's no time wasted on either side. And so, all, and so lastly, um, automate, right? Um, use the automation features in, in your marketing system, right? Use the workflow capabilities of your AMS. Um, subscriptions, right? If you want me to see something and you want me to look at it every day, subscribe me to it, right? So that it shows up in, in my inbox, right? Really look for ways that you can uh, automate uh, your your uh, your day to day. All right, Bill. As um, you're saying automate, Katie here is saying that she found that when they automated, they weren't responding at such a high rate. And I think great, right? We tried it, and we used our data to analyze if it was working or not, and it wasn't. So we moved on and we found another solution. And I think that's part of our messaging today is. Right. Don't be afraid to try something. If it works, great. We found a solution. If it doesn't, our data will tell us that. Katie, I'm super happy that you didn't just keep automating things and not have anybody at your annual conference next year, that you were yes. able to use the data and figure out another solution around that. Maybe there are pieces of our emails we can automate, right? Someone told me that when they do exhibitor or booth selection, that they personally send out each one of those emails because nobody was opening the automated email. So maybe there are ways we can automate some of our communications versus having to automate everything. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, Greg's, uh, Greg's really good at this. I mean, he's like a, a bit of an expert on, on, uh, on, on sales emails and things like that, that we get. So, you know, there's like everything else, right. There's an art and a science to it. You know, the, the science part is setting up the automations and all that, but, um, you know, the, you know, the best automated emails are the ones that don't look automated, right. Uh, that's, that's number one, but also remember that we don't want to just send that out to everybody. We want to segment. And, uh, if I can, if I can offer you something in the email that that shows that uh, that I'm in tune with your your preferences and your interests, then obviously that's going to have a much better chance um, of uh, of success. So, okay, uh, so how can you uh, how can you do more with less, right? So that's so that's a question that I would put. You know, it's for if you have a good idea that you can share in the chat, that would be amazing. If not, it's certainly something that um, that you should be thinking about uh, as you uh, kind of get off this webinar. And uh, you want to, um, you know, kind of deal with or, or prepare for that that future, you know, economic and, and other uncertainty. Okay, um, so let's talk about uh, time savings. So I think doing more with less is challenging because you're really like, if we have less, we're going to do less, right? That that makes sense. But the key here is investing time and effort now to save and benefit future you. And this is really hard for us from a psychological standpoint. If you're a Freakonomics fan, they just did a podcast about this, talking about like, why do we spoil our dinner by eating all the almonds on the table before we get to the <laughs> dinner table? We know we're not going to be hungry when we get there, but those almonds are so good. We're going to eat them. So like, how do we create space and time for ourselves to invest in our future self? Because we know the time savings are there. And I think a great quote here is from Eric O'Connor, um, right? Their staff invested in analytics. They took the time to build out dashboards and to build out automated processes and he said, well, you know, what? why did we do this? Well, he asked his team what their biggest frustrations were. And they said they had to pull all these reports and it was constantly time consuming. There was always another report they were building. And he said, he, now he's giving them back 20 hours a week because they have all those insights at one click, right? But in order to get those insights at one click, they had to stop and be present and say, look, we know we have this problem. Let's invest time now to get that time back down the road, right? because you might feel like our friend here. Ah, right, but too many, I'm juggling all these balls. I can't possibly set them down for one second and focus on this, Greg. Well, I'm gonna give you a license today. What if one of the two of those balls drop and hit the ground? Like, it's okay, right? We'll pick it up later if anybody notices. Maybe no one even notices we dropped the ball on that one and that's okay, right? And I, I think Reggie had a great quote at our, at our conference this year or last year. He said, like, we're building reports for everything. That's not really the insights people wanted. He said they had over 600 reports, all with a unique name, right? The January 2013 product sales pull report for Debbie. It's like, okay, we spent how much time to create that port to use it once? Why don't we just have a monthly dashboard that everybody can go to and get the answers they want? So investing that little bit of time now, maybe letting one or two of those balls hit the ground. So when we pick them up, we're better. Um, you know, we've got that on autopilot. We've automated that process. I think that's a really good way to be successful at this. All right, awesome. So we're uh, we're kind of wrapping up here. Uh, we're going to end. Usually we do key takeaways. So today we're going to do pro tips. And uh, so one of the things that we did leading up to this is we asked uh, uh, some of our executives, including our CEO uh, Julie, like you know what are uh, what are associations doing or what should they be doing? And and some of those things 
are here in the pro tips and some are things that we've uh, that we've covered already. So um, first thing is is develop a, a data strategy, right? So we started there. That's um, that's our next webinar. Um, how do we do that, right? So um, we're going to cover all of that. But the point is is that the data strategy underlies a lot of these things, right? Because uh, you need that strategy in order to um, to understand how you should build and um, and continuously improve your uh, your value proposition. Um, you need that data to to segment and to optimize your delivery. And of course, you need data and you need a good way to collect and analyze it in order to look at uh, performance, right? So data strategy is really important to accomplish in your mission, doing more with less and all those kinds of things, right? Uh, what else should we do, Greg? We should build an executive dashboard, right? Think about all the time we spend building one of reports to answer one of questions. It's the beginning of the new year. We've got free time to do it. What is the report you're going to run every week, every month, every quarter? What's that thing you're going to tell another department every time they ask? Let's just build a dashboard for that now. Let's just create that generic report. It might take us a little extra time. Maybe we're sitting at home on Saturday and we're spending a little <laughs> bit of extra time to build that. Hey, we're going to, Barb, we're going to invest a little bit of our free time. I'm going to spend a little bit of time this weekend building some dashboards that me and my team can look at every week. And I don't have to build them on a daily basis, right? I can prep for these webinars. I can uh, spend time with you all um, at happy hour. Those sort of fun things. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, so look, next, another one of those things that sort of gets uh, gets pushed down the road is is training and uh, and data literacy. You know, so um, that's a big part of the data strategies. We got to have people to to implement our recommendations. And we have to have people that can consume uh, consume reports and all of that. You know, but more than that. If we want to win that uh, that war for talent, we better have good training. We better have good professional development. Um, we want to cultivate data literacy um, in our in our organizations. And if we're not doing that, you know, we're, we're hurting our chances of keeping the best people, but also of, of staying competitive as an association. So um, it's never uh, it's never a good time, right? And as you know, Barbara said we're not. You know, in some ways, we have we have less time than than we've had before, but. You never have time when things are going well, when everything is booming, you know, when the economy is through the roof and, and you know, you have, uh, you know, members joining and, and the, uh, the the events are um, are breaking records and all of that. You know, there's never time to, to get to stuff like this. So one way or another, we got to find a way to focus on that because that really is part of our of our hedgehog. Right. If that's if you have to to let something else fall uh, to focus on these things, then uh, I'd recommend that you do that. Uh, Okay, tell us about tools, Greg. This was surprising to me, right? It's maybe counterintuitive to some of us. I think this is a really important one is some of the homegrown tools that we have that were built that are legacy that have always been there. It's, it's time to get rid of them and scrap them. It's time to modernize. If your tool doesn't get upgrades, if your tool isn't integrated, if your tool has to be supported by your internal team, if you're the only company that uses that tool in the whole world, that <laughs> might not be a best in breed tool for you and your team, right? So we're thinking of those homegrown solutions that it's good enough and it's not worth, it's not broken. So we don't need to fix it. If we've got a little time right now to focus on fixing those things, right? The, I'm going to make it up. The call for papers tool that we built five years ago is great. It's fine. Yeah. We're not really having a huge event this year. Let's go out and build a new, let's go buy a new tool off the shelf. that's just going to work for us that we don't have to put development time and effort into anymore. So we can then focus on our hedgehogs, right? Is your hedgehog being a software development company? It's probably not. Your hedgehog's probably being an association. And if you're spending time, I know it's fun building and developing software, you're not spending time focusing on what is unique that you can do. So scrutinize those homegrown tools. Think about the things that you use that are frustrating in your daily life and cause additional friction that doesn't need to be there. Um, just like building those one of reports, spend a little bit more time on the front end this year um, refreshing those tools, getting a best in breed off the shelf platform, minimizing our customizations, using it the way it was designed to be used, um, and allowing us to spend time um, hedgehogging. Awesome. And lastly, this is kind of a catch all, but invest in that foundational stuff. Uh, you know, so yeah, so training PD is, is part of it, but uh, like data governance, right? Data cleanup, right? What about all those processes that you haven't uh, documented, right? Greg said, if somebody leaves the organization, what are you going to do? Um, all of those things that uh, that are foundational, right? To uh, uh, to all the other stuff we talked about, um, never seems like the right time to invest, but um, now's the right time, right? And uh, especially because 
one of the things that's uh, that's interesting about our, our current economy and, and all those conditions is, I mean, there's there's no uh, consensus on how long it's going to last, right? And, you know, it could be uh, it could be another uh, another six months, and you know, it could be much longer than that. So uh, we need to to do all these things as though it's going to you know persist for uh, for a long time. All right, uh, that's all we have today. Uh, want to uh, again remind you about our uh, data strategy webinar coming up. That's on the fifteenth at three p.m. Um, hope uh, some of you can uh, can join us for that. Uh, there's a, a QR code to the right here. And last, uh, in case you missed it, um, this is uh, this is a blog. You know that's a, a recap of our uh, keynote at our uh, our Predict conference. Um, you know, three keys for transforming your association with uh, with analytics. So, um, you guys all know Reggie. Um, he's uh, he's always got good things to say, and uh, this is uh, uh, this is a good read. Right, it'll take you a few minutes, and it's uh, it's well worth doing that. So, uh, with that, uh, that's all I got. Any uh, any last words, Greg? Yeah, I think in uh, challenging, com com you know, uh, uncertain this economy. Use those unique advantages to your benefit. Use the fact that we are the thought leader, we have the members, we have the insights, and we have the data at our fingertips. Use that as your competitive advantage. Cut the fat on the sides that aren't aren't your hedgehog, right? Focus on the things you're really good at. Spend a little bit of time at the beginning of the year investing. Um, and then you can join Matt and I as we party over the weekend because we did all of our homework on Friday. You know, I lied. I said I have one more thing. I'm going to answer one question that no one asked, but I bet people thought of it, which is, hey, look, um, it's great, but this stuff doesn't apply to me, right? I'm a staff person, right? I'm a director. I'm a manager. I'm not an executive. And um, one of the things that that we've talked about before is is working down the funnel, right? Starting with things that are strategic and long term, down to things that are sort of tactical. Um, and short term, this is an example of working up the funnel, basically, right? Because all of these same concepts apply, you know, they apply, of course, to the whole organization, but uh, maybe differently, but they also apply to the departments and really down to everything that um, that individuals uh, do, right? So, um, and this is, again, it's a, it's a topic for another time, but you can apply the same things to what you want to do with your own personal time, right? What, what makes the biggest impact? How do you help your department? How does your department help the overall mission and all that? So, um, on a, it's a different, uh, it's a different scale, you know, but all of the same concepts apply. I encourage you to, uh, um, to utilize them if you can. All right. Thanks everybody. We'll give you back uh, two whole minutes uh, of your afternoon and hope to see you all again soon. Thanks everyone. See you at the next one.